So before we get into this video talking about all things food in the 1980s, I have to warn you that you may get hungry. I'm serious. You're gonna need a snack, so grab one. Are you in the mood for backpack sushi? Or is a processed boneless pork product shaped into ribs, slathered in barbecue sauce, and slapped on a bun with pickles and onions more your style? Do you know which filthy object a movie star used to make his now famous brand of salad dressings? And which fish nearly went extinct because foodies were so obsessed with it? Do you know which fruit was alleged to be pumped with cyanide? Let's take it year by year and find out the answers to these questions and more. Be sure to like this video, subscribe, and check out the full-length episodes of Lectual Does the 80s. Year, New Yorkers Tim and Nina Zagat released a guide based on a survey of restaurants by 200 people that told the 17.5 million people who live there, plus all the tourists, the trendiest places to eat. The city, already known for having tons of different foods from various ethnicities, became a playground of fine dining in the 1980s for yuppies and foodies. One of the fastest growing trends in the New York food scene for the decade was sushi. Published the New York Times in 1980, Manhattan now has several true sushi bars, where nearly all the dishes are based on bite and a half sized nuggets of rice and fish. Sushi would be immortalized in films like 1985's The Breakfast Club, where Molly Ringwald's snooty character delicately pulls out room temperature, if not downright warm sushi. What's that? Sushi. Sushi? <laughs> rice, uh, raw fish, and seaweed. You won't accept a guy's tongue in your mouth and you're gonna eat that? Can I eat? I don't know. Give it a try. Honestly, I'm not sure which option was the least appetizing. Ali Sheedy's sugar and Captain Crunch sandwich or Molly Ringwald's hot backpack sushi. Anywho, back to the history. Not everyone could afford sushi. For those who enjoyed a good cheap item from the frozen food sections, 1980 was a standout year because steakums were taken nationwide by H.G. Hines, a writer. It was also a standout year for actor Paul Newman, who along with three friends decided to make a vat of salad dressing. They didn't have anything to stir it with, so Newman grabbed a canoe paddle, wrote a friend on the momentous occasion. Newman came back and started churning, and I said, you're out of your goddamn mind. That paddle isn't sterile, nothing is sterile, but he didn't care. And fortunately, after we gave it to the neighbors as gifts, no one died. And this is why you don't eat everybody food. Two years later, Newman and his friends established Newman's Own with a bottle of olive oil and vinegar salad dressing that said, fine food since February. The company would come to make dressing, salsa, pasta sauce, frozen pizza, and more. 100% of its tax profits went to Newman's Charity Foundation, with over $550 million generated since 1982. Thankfully, canoe paddles are no longer used in the making of Newman's food. it was announced that Americans were spending 38 cents of every food dollar in a restaurant, fast food store, or take-home mart, up from 26 cents in 1960. Chicken was especially popular at chain restaurants, thanks to new calls to reduce one's intake of red meat, which had been linked in the late 70s to poor cholesterol and other health issues. So when McDonald's faced a chicken shortage for its newly created nuggets and McChickens, they rolled out the pork McRib. What'd you say this was again? McDonald's calls it the McRib sandwich. It's a new kind of cue. McRib? I don't see any bones. Hey, who wants bones in a sandwich? Right. McRib is all meat. Sales weren't impressive and it was yanked from the menu in 1985, though it would return sporadically like a cult status unicorn. 1981 was also the year that U.S. pasta consumption reached 13 pounds per person annually. Speaking of pounds, Ronald Reagan ordered 7,000 pounds of Jelly Belly jelly beans before his inauguration. He was known to keep a jar filled with the disgusting candies on his desk and even carried them to cabinet meetings. Though Reagan's favorite flavor was licorice, he's responsible for for blueberry. Wrote the LA Times, Reagan
Reagan persuaded the company to produce the flavor so he and his staff could distribute a red, white, and blue mix of the jelly beans. Lastly, in 1981, the first microwave popcorn hit the shelves, but it required refrigeration because it had perishable butter. Pillsbury also offered a frozen microwave popcorn, which is crazy to me. I'd love some great tasting popcorn right now. Why can't I find one I like from my microwave? Now you can! Pillsbury Microwave Popcorn. It's frozen for freshness and incredible flavor. Pops up hot and delicious in less than five minutes. Five minutes?! People in the 80s really walked so we can fly. Within two years, microwave popcorn was bringing in $53 million in sales. And after a shelf-stable non-refrigerator version was introduced in 1984, within two years, Americans were buying $250 million worth of popcorn a year. When E.T. the Extraterrestrial became a worldwide sensation, a treat touted as the alien's favorite candy created five years previously also became popular. Within two weeks of the film's release, the sale of Reese's Pieces tripled. 1982 was also the year that the cereal company General Mills created Olive Garden, yes, the cereal company, which would have 145 locations by the end of the decade. Also, the New York Times declared the pasta salad is here to stay, predicting the wave of tricolor pasta salad recipes that would pop up in restaurants, cookbooks, and office potlucks. McNuggets were finally made available worldwide this year after McDonald's fixed a supply chain issue. Meanwhile, the National Restaurant Association found that 40% of consumers had changed their eating habits out of nutritional concern. This is the year that aspartame is approved by the FDA as a sugar substitute in carbonated beverages, and the same year that Jenny Craig and her husband began a weight loss nutrition program in Australia, and it would arrive in America just two years later. The Wendy's baked potato, which in addition to now familiar flavors also included broccoli and cheese was a part of a larger shift in society to eat healthier. You know where to get all these steaming hot stuffed baked potatoes. You get them at Wendy's. For potato lovers of all kinds, there was more good news this year. Though originally invented in the 1950s at a dude ranch, Hidden Valley Ranch would become a nationwide staple when a shelf-stable version hit the stores. The flavor would become a popular choice for snacks and salads for health nuts. Also that year, the owner of the floundering Panda Inn restaurant accepted an offer to create a fast food version of his restaurant for the food court at Glendale's Galleria Mall. Panda Express was launched in October 1983 and quickly expanded across the country. Meanwhile, as the Reagan administration spent the early 80s scaling back welfare provisions for poverty and hunger and shifting government responsibility to the private sector, in 1983, White House counselor and later Attorney General Edwin Meese said, I don't know of any authoritative figures that there are hungry children. We've had considerable evidence that people go to soup kitchens because the food is free and that's easier than paying for it. Just four years later, it was reported by the New York Times that the number of food pantries in New York alone had grown from 30 in 1980 to almost 500 in 1987. Many were paid for by the private sector and ran by volunteers, with 85% being church affiliated. The article detailed, contrary to public perception, it is not the homeless who are seeking out most of the meals. About 70% of the free meals go to people who have places to live and are provided in the form of canned and packaged goods. These people were overwhelmed by rising rent and utilities bills, a 1983 minimum wage freeze, and other effects from trickle-down economic Economics. In addition to soup kitchens, food banks also grew in importance. A 2002 report found that over 90% of food banks, about 80% of emergency kitchens, and all known food rescue organizations were established in the U.S. after 1981. Thanks, Reagan! July of this year, Ronald Reagan signed into law that it was National Ice Cream Month, with July 15th becoming National Ice Cream Day. McDonald's also began serving McDLTs, which was special because it included fresh lettuce and tomatoes that were separated into its own wasteful packaging. Extremely wasteful and unable to compete with Burger King's Whopper, the burger would be discontinued by the 90s. time.
time to school you on the long-running Coke versus Pepsi wars. The two companies were duking it out for dominance, with Pepsi wanting to appear young and fresh and Coke relying on its age and branding to stay on top. 1982's Diet Coke was major. You can get dizzy walking through the supermarket beverage aisle besides the natural sodas, the no salt added drinks, the real colas, the un-colas, flavors for every palate. There is the no caffeine cola, the no caffeine low-cal cola poured into the market just yesterday by Pepsi. Now, 24 hours later, comes yet another newcomer. But Pepsi followed it up the next year by securing an endorsement from the king of pop, Michael Jackson. He appealed to a younger generation in the popular commercial, which also featured a child actor named Alfonso Ribeiro. way it was popular urban legend that Alfonso died from snapping his neck in the commercial but clearly he survived because he ended up being Carlton on the Fresh Prince. So in 1985 Coke definitely thought they had a hit on their hands with New Coke, a reformulated version of their familiar product. After years of the Pepsi challenge in which blind taste tests revealed people preferred Pepsi sweeter taste, Coke thought it needed to be sweeter too. Though New Coke initially sold well, many Coke drinkers, particularly those who lived in the South and considered Coke a part of their regional identity, rejected New Coke. It was the idea of it, of changing a constant like Coca-Cola. By mid-May, the Coca-Cola company's Atlanta headquarters had hired extra operators to handle the 5,000 angry calls coming in each day. By June, they were handling 8,000 a day. Just like the soldiers in World War II wrote these love letters about the brand, the American people were astounded that we would change the formula for a product that had been part of their lives for almost a century at the time it was introduced. And they told us in no uncertain terms that we shouldn't do that. We didn't have the right to change the formula of their product. Coke received over 40,000 letters and phone calls, with several critics comparing the change to a Pepsi-style beverage as a surrender to the Yankees. A bunch of angry drama queen consumers got together and formed Old Cola Drinkers of America to try to convince Coke to bring back the old formula. Pepsi even took advantage of all the commotion, putting out the following ad. What's the matter, Wilbur? They changed my Coke. Something wrong with it? I know, but they sure changed it. Could have asked. I could have. I stuck with them through three wars and a couple of dust storms, but this is too much. Guess something big made them change. Right, big. Right, big. Pepsi, the choice of a new generation. Still could have asked. 79 days after introducing new Coke, it was announced that Coca-Cola Classic would return. The extraordinary sales after led many observers to wonder if the whole thing had been orchestrated to capitalize on the outrage. Lastly this year, the Cinnabon chain started in a Seattle mall food court, with the soon-to-be-famous pastries originally being baked with raisins. Burger King's French Toast Sticks in 1986 was representative of the rise in on-the-go eating for breakfast, as many people were commuters. Plenty of restaurants wanted to get in on the breakfast bag, but many, like Wendy's, couldn't sustain it. McDonald's, meanwhile, rolled out salads to keep up with the demand for healthy options. New taste toss fresh all day. I'm McDonald's. Also in 1986, the California Raisins made their debut as a way to promote the faltering raisin industry. The guy who pitched the commercial to the California Raisin Advisory Board said, We've tried everything but dancing raisins, singing I Heard It Through the Grapevine by Marvin Gaye. So the California Raisin Advisory Board took a gamble. The California Raisin version of the song landed on the Billboard Hot 100 and peaked at 84. The commercials became super popular and even led to a ton of California Raisin merchandise like albums, clothes, lunch boxes and Halloween costumes. And when Hardee's introduced cinnamon and raisin biscuits, it gave away highly sought after California raisin figurines for 99 cents. Ooh, I heard it the and now when you buy any two
two Rise and Shine biscuits or any dessert, you can get a cool California raisin for only 99 cents. Something else highly sought after was redfish, which became a staple of the 1980s Cajun food trend. Chef Paul Prudhomme's dishes were often spicy and or blackened, but this was his style and not specifically Cajun. Cajun cuisine was heavily distorted by his prestige because spicy and blackened foods not previously incorporated became all the rage. Black and red drum redfish was especially popular, in which the precious fish was dipped in melted butter, doused in salt, pepper, paprika, and garlic, and seared until cooked with a thin black crust on the outside. So popular was the dish that fishermen along the Atlantic coast grew concerned about scarcity and conservationists worried about extinction. Reported the New York Times in 1986, from the west coast of Florida to the Louisiana islands, fleets of commercial trawlers are combing the shallow gulf waters, using spotter planes and huge sands to stalk a fish that until 1980 was little known north of Baton Rouge. The LA Times added, in 1980, the year before Prudhomme put fish to skillet, the commercial redfish catch in the Gulf of Mexico was 1.6 million pounds. Last year, it was 6.3 million pounds. By the way, Prudhomme trademarked the turducken, or a chicken stuffed into a duck into a turkey. And lastly, because microwaves were growing in use, so were foods created just for them. One such failed venture was the Micro Magic brand, which included soggy or too hard french fries, frozen in the middle, or two overheated cheeseburgers, and I don't know who thought this was a good idea, but defrosted ice cream billed as milkshakes. It was frozen ice cream and they just melted it in the microwave. Anyways, the ill-fated foods made a sneaky product placement appearance in 1989's Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. <laughs> M&M's, which since 1976 have been missing from bags of the candy-coated chocolate pieces due to a red dye scare, returned this year. For the 11 years that they were gone, the makers of M&M's were annoyed with phone calls and letters from loyalists, again showing how much Americans love their brands. 1987 is the same year that microwave sales reached 12.6 million and when Dairy Queen bought Orange Julius. Though it had been around since 1926, during the 1980s, Orange Julius became a staple of mall food courts. Due to the popularity of malls during this decade, mall food courts really came into their own and experimented with bringing in different cuisines, like the aforementioned Panda Express. And cookies were an especially popular food court product, with brands like Mrs. Fields and Great American Cookies. By the end of this year, Mrs. Fields Cookies will have 65 stores with 600 employees and projected sales of $20 million. And there are now seven varieties of cookies. The lady who baked it all isn't your snowy-haired grandmother. Deborah Fields just turned 26. It looks like she should be on a Vogue cover rather than baking up new ideas in her kitchen. Both Mrs. Fields and Great American Cookies were founded in 1977, but found massive success in the 80s, with Great American Cookies earning over $100 million a year by 1985. Lunchables were rolled out by Oscar Mayer in a Seattle test market to revitalize boring old bologna. One of its proposed names was Cracker Witches, which thankfully was denied. A variation of meats and cheeses were added, and the famous school lunch charcuterie kits were taken nationwide the next year. wanted a slice of the $21 billion pizza market, so it unveiled their version nationwide in 1989. Mocked Pizza Hut in a commercial, don't make a mistake, come to Pizza Hut for a real pizza. Mickey D's pizzas were popular, and by the 90s, 40% of all McDonald's served pizza. Also in 1989, a phone call to the U.S. Embassy in Santiago, Chile, began a chain of events that resulted in an 11-day embargo of Chilean fruit. The anonymous phone call warned that two red flame grapes on the way to the U.S. had been injected with cyanide. Reported the LA Times, 
in an action that may virtually eliminate peaches, plums, nectarines, and red seedless grapes from grocery shelves across the country, the federal government announced Monday that it's impounding all fruit imports from Chile after traces of cyanide were found in a shipment of Chilean grapes. Over 2 million crates of Chilean fruit was impounded and approximately 20,000 Chilean food workers lost their jobs. Many consumers in the U.S. and several other countries stopped eating grapes of any kind for a month. Tons of grapes and other Chilean fruit were destroyed, and no real evidence of contamination was ever found. 1989 was a big year for food scares because a similar thing happened to apples. Environmental activists said on 60 Minutes that Alar, a chemical sprayed on apples to keep them from falling off of trees before they ripen, caused cancer. Dimenazide, which has been sprayed on apples for more than 20 years, breaks down into another chemical called UDMH. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is supposed to monitor pesticide residues in our food including residues of the apple spray UDMH. Meryl Streep even spoke out about the supposed health risk. As a result, millions of people stopped buying apples and the apple industry voluntarily decided to stop using Alar. The government, meanwhile, bought 15 million worth of apples to reduce the surplus. The apples largely went to schools, prisons, and food aid programs. Whether or not Alar was harmful is still contentious, but the entire incident contributed to a growing concern and skepticism about the food available to American consumers, as well as discourse about alarmist media. To close out this video, I'd like to dedicate a few moments to the treats from the 1980s that I wish I could try but can't because they floated into the abyss of time. Pour a little out for Keebler's Potato Skins, Nintendo Cereal System, which is a really weird name, Care Bear Frozen Waffles, you Care Bear Waffles, Dolly Lake Waffles, Dutch Apple Pop-Tarts, Colgate Frozen Dinners, yes, I'm talking about the toothpaste brand, Taco Bell C seafood salad. Brush that piece of paper down to Taco Bell no later than Sunday. We'll give you a delicious seafood salad for just $2.99. And Wendy's Super Bar, which was a $2.99 buffet with Italian, Mexican, and salad offerings. With delicious foods like Mexican, Italian, and our garden spot, so you can make a meal that's as individual as you are. Calling all children or adults of the 1980s. Did you get to try these? Did I miss any foods? Let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching this video and be sure to watch episode 2 of Lectual Does the 80s where I discuss the rich and poor in Reagan's America along with a little more 1980s food history like the origins of government cheese.